Welcome back to our weekly conversation called Survive to Thrive, Live the Story You Create. What this is, if this is your first time tuning in, is a series of conversations that take place every single Saturday at 4 p.m. Central Time or 5 p.m. Eastern Time or whatever other time zone that you're in. And that is where we host an hour-long discussion around the connection of one's personal narrative to the topics of resilience, grief, appreciation, and today's conversation will be talking about inspiration. And in particular, the question that at least I think the question we're going to start off with, it's going to be where does inspiration come from? But in case you haven't listened to any of the previous episodes before that we've had, just know that the conversation can go anywhere and everywhere, but we always do find a way to come back around and answer the bigger question. The guest that I want to have on the show her name is Rebecca Helford. She was a previous guest on our podcast before. And as I mentioned to her earlier, that is an episode that I've really listened to many, many times by now. And I hope you get a chance to check it out as well. She's someone that I connected with. And it's been a while, like a couple months by now. And we instantly just hit it off and we were able to have this dialogue. So if you want to see the previous episode, please go ahead and check it out. And one other thing that I wanted to mention to you is this. Later tonight in about an hour, Overcoming Odds, along with one other nonprofit, is going to be two nonprofit beneficiaries from an event that a mutual connection of myself and Scott Mason and Casey Berman and so many other people who are involved as part of Overcoming Odds is going to be putting together. And you can see it at the bottom. It is called A Musical Evening of Giving happening in about an hour or so. So if you'd like to support us, please go to her website and purchase a ticket, and that would help us tremendously. And with that said, I'd like to welcome our guest, Rebecca Helford, onto the show so that we can have a conversation around this topic of where does inspiration come from? We are Rebecca. How are you? Good. How are you gonna leg? Thank you. Thanks for joining, and and I'm glad that we're able to do this, and I'm also glad that we were able to record because you know, knowing the two of us, we would um, <laughs> we do we do have sometimes a tendency to have a podcast prior to the podcast, which is beautiful. I think that's one of the things that I really value about our connection is the ability to literally pick up anywhere and anywhere and, and have some of these deeper di dialogues. And this is a topic that I've been really interested in for quite some time, A, because um, the more I thought about it, the more complex the answer became. And that is when I really started to think about this question of where does inspiration come from and why do I feel inspired by some things and not the others, for example, I almost hit a wall, to be honest with you. And that's, <laughs> and that's where I think like having the two of us converse and as well as anyone else that chooses to tune in or watch this on replay uh, through their insights can also help me understand. But I'm curious that maybe one of the best ways that we can even start this off is in thinking about the question yourself, because I know you, you shared some insights with me prior to us going live. And that is, where do you think inspiration comes from from your perspective or maybe even what is your relationship with inspiration to begin with yeah, yeah there are two things i think about really clearly when it comes to the topic of inspiration because i i have thought about it quite a bit as i mentioned before we went live in the in the pre-party i <laughs> <laughs> when i first came out to los angeles i was so excited to get to be a part of all the exciting opportunities that there are here. And one of those things is the Groundlings Theater, which is a kind of world famous launching place for many famous comedians and actors. It's a hub of improvisational theater and comedy. I didn't want to be an actor. I just wanted to learn how they do these things. I'd grown up watching 
whose line is it anyway? And it felt like magic. How are they doing these incredible things, telling these stories out of nowhere that are genius and hilarious? So I signed up, I auditioned. You have to audition, it's kind of terrifying. And I made it. <laughs> I bet everyone gets in, like, cause it's just, they're just taking your money and there's no promise that anything's gonna happen. But a lot of people think they're gonna make it cause you can get discovered. I, I had no interest in that. Mm -hmm. but every week I would take myself, I would drive all the way out to uh, Melrose Boulevard where it is and I would sit in my car and I would have a panic attack and I would call my then boyfriend who's now my husband and say, Ross, I can't do this. It's too much pressure, it's too scary. And he'd be like, okay take a deep breath and just get in there. And some weeks I would get a few laughs, some weeks I would bomb spectacularly, some weeks I would feel like such a fraud, some weeks I would have the best time. And even though I, I never had any interest in being a professional actor, it, it seeded within me this love of an improvisational mindset. It mm. helped me ungrip my mind and let go of the idea that I had to plan what I was gonna say I could just open my brain, open my mouth and let something come out and that it would be something, anything. Who the heck knows? You just start saying something. Um, ever since then, my love of improv has continued. And so I've done improv workshops for therapists and training, for parents, for early childhood educators. Uh, I've done a lot of collaboration with a colleague of mine. Big shout out to Karen Gudeman of Improv Parenting in Minneapolis, Minnesota. She and I recently just collaborated on a workshop about how to have difficult conversations and give authentic feedback using mm. improv. And I used improv games to help people mm -hmm. with that. Um, there's a fabulous book about this called Improv Wisdom by a woman named Patricia Madsen. And in this book, she talks about the idea of inspiration and where it comes from. And it, this idea has stuck with me. Uh, since I read that book ages ago. And her idea is this. The ancient Greeks did not believe that inspiration came from within. It did not, in their mind, come from the human mind. It was a gift from the gods. Mm -hmm. So all you had to do was be ready to receive, and the inspiration would come. And I love that idea because the truth is, where who even knows where inspiration comes from? Yeah. I mean, I, I could do a little, I could do a little exercise, a little in vivo improv exercise with us later, just as an example of who even knows what's in your mind, right? So, so that's one thing is being ready to receive, and it, you know whether you believe in Greek gods or other kinds of gods and goddesses or you know magical creatures, maybe that's where inspiration comes from. I don't know. It certainly sort of takes the pressure off. Um, and another thought that I have about inspiration is that. It's about connections, random connections, seemingly random connections between seemingly disparate things. Whenever I write, so I have a blog, Living in Captivity, where I, I write about raising children, raising ourselves, raising humanity. I'm always kind of, I'm not writing about one thing. I'm usually writing about something and connecting it to another thing and maybe connecting that to a third thing. It's the art of metaphor. Um, and oftentimes I'll find that I'll kind of start writing something and I'll have to like kind of go away and just leave it alone. And then maybe something I heard on a podcast, maybe your podcast, or something somebody randomly told me in one of my therapy sessions or something I saw on a billboard. I'll just be sort of sitting there. Maybe I'll have had my evening beverage, you know, my, my daily beer. <laughs> and this is kind of like kind of glue together and connections form. And I'm like, oh, you know, that box of waffle cones that has the weird picture of a salad being served in a waffle cone. <laughs> why is the perfect metaphor for 2020? Because it is like it was a giant mess and you couldn't look away. And why is it like that? And can it just stop? And Salad and a waffle cone. It's on my website. Read it. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I think we put a lot of pressure on ourselves. And I, I get a lot of people coming in to see me who may feel really non-inspired, not very creative, not very connected to a sense of flow, a sense of spontaneity. Um, 
And I feel like my perspective is kind of helping people get out of their own way and discover mm -hmm. these connections, be connected to whatever can show up spontaneously if we just allow ourselves to receive, um, you know, and allowing, just kind of allowing those things to happen. Those are, those are some, just some ideas that I have, you know, I have more. Well, I, I think the other thing that's really interesting about what you just mentioned, and maybe this is a cultural thing that I've experienced is the tendency to want to know the answers, right? When it comes to a lot of these things, I, I know for me, it has taken me and it still is a work in progress, many, many years to accept the fact that I don't know certain things about uh, anything, if I'm being honest, because as soon as I, as soon as I think I know something, there's always more to know. And so all of a sudden I'm in this land of, I don't know. Now, what I have gotten to is it has taken me quite a few years to get to a point to even acknowledge that as an answer. And I think part of it was the culture that I was raised in. Same exact thing, trying to understand where does inspiration come from? there's that tendency for me to, I've got to find the answer. I've got to know where it is. When the reality of the matter is, I mean, I may never know because there's so many different forces at stake. And I think the other thing about inspiration that's also really beautiful is that it does happen spontaneously. I mean, I can prepare for it. I can sit here and I could say, okay, the next word Rebecca's going to say is going to inspire me to do X, Y, and Z. But the, the, reality, <laughs> the reality of the matter is like, I, I don't know, like, is that true? And to what degree? And, you know, what if you don't choose to say anything? And there's just so many factors that play into it. And, I, and that, that's one of the things that I really find interesting is that inspiration can come in so many different forms and so many different sizes and from so many different things. Yeah. One day I may look at a person and I may not feel inspired next day they say something or just their presence alone. And all of a sudden it's just like, boom, everything I ever needed. What's the difference? I have no idea. It's the same person. It could be the same exact room. They could be wearing the same exact things, but yet just due to the fact that I'm looking at them with a different perspective, it opens it up. And, and I'm also curious going back to kind of the workshop and everything that you've done. How much do you think the ability to be open-minded and open-hearted plays in actually being able to receive and create inspiration internally? Oh, like, is there more than 100%? <laughs> I mean, I, I mean that's, that's all there is. I, I mean, being open-hearted being open-minded, being process-oriented, being question-oriented as opposed to answer-oriented or outcome-oriented, these are all incredibly important parts of finding inspiration um, and I think also finding joy and flow mm -hmm. in our lives. You know, my a former supervisor of mine, Harold Young, uh, would always say, you know, insight is the booby prize, meaning mm -hmm. you could be analyzed you know, you could be in psychoanalysis for 10 years and just come out a well-analyzed jerk. You'd have all these great insights, but so, so what? Answers are of limited value. And it's so funny because you asked this question initially, like, why am I drawn to this and not yeah. that? Therapists are kind of compulsively trained out of asking why questions because they are inherently fruitless in terms of what they generate. They just put people on the defensive. They're, the answers mm -hmm. are not gonna be that helpful anyway. Um, like who even knows, why is purple my favorite color? I don't know. <laughs> it just is and there's no other color that's better. I dare you to tell me one. It just is, <laughs> you know? So, you know, there's this piece of like, being aware of the cultural biases that you pointed out, that we do live in this mm -hmm. very results-driven, product-oriented, uh, commodity-oriented culture, as opposed to a process, ambience, you know, what's going on culture. And this shows up in our art, which I always, I have found very interesting. There's a really cool book called Understanding Comics by a guy named Scott McLeod. And it's a comic book about comic storytelling art. And he breaks down what happens in frame by frame storytelling, because what happens between frames, you fill in the gap, 
right? Mm -hmm. like one frame is a person holding a knife and then the next frame is a dead body. You killed the person between the frames. Like you're the, you are making up what happens in between. So the juncture of what happens between those frames can have many different purposes. One is action to action. What I just described is like action to action. Um, there's moment to moment, which is like one second, next second, next second. There's also aspect to aspect, which is the whole uh, page is one scene and each frame is, here's a frog sitting over here. Here is the rain coming down. Here's a tree. It's all the same moment. There's a couple other ones. Someone, it wasn't Scott McClug, it was somebody else who did an analysis comparing American style comic books to manga, Japanese style comic books. And it's probably not surprising to anybody who's familiar with the vast cultural differences between those two groups that the American comics rely mostly on action to action, right? Mm -hmm. Something happening, mm -hmm. something happening, something happening, something happening. But the, the Japanese comics, the manga comics, are all about aspect to aspect, which is more of an ambient feel. And, and if you've watched, say, the difference between like Moana and My Neighbor Totoro, right? An American cartoon versus a Japanese cartoon movie. You know, it's not My Neighbor Totoro, which is a fabulous movie. And if you haven't watched it, you should watch it. It's mostly nothing happening. There's like a whole long scene where these two little girls meet a giant forest creature named a Totoro at a bus stop. And it's mostly them kind of standing there in the rain and like looking at the Totoro and the Totoro looks at them and the rain falls and there's a frog, you know, <laughs> and it's just you're in the moment. It's very like present oriented, but any, any, any Disney movie, any American animated movie is going to be action to action to action to action to action until you get to the resolution. Hooray. Mm -hmm. But it's not, you know, my neighbor Totoro and other movies like it and other, other, aspects of more Eastern storytelling are much more about the journey, you know? And, and that's kind of, I, I think in improv and in being inspired, it's about being in the moment and finding some joy, finding some connection in those moments, as opposed to any one thing. You know, if you've ever done an improv scene or seen an improv scene, someone just cuts it at some point and says, okay, scene, yeah. you know, we're out of time or whatever, but you know, whatever happened was, whatever happened. Mm -hmm. I've actually been wanting to do improv for quite, quite some time now. And I just, I haven't, uh, I haven't pulled the trigger at that for whatever reasons, but I, I've been a, I've, I've had an interest in comedy for many, many years. Plus I just genuinely think that, um, I'm a pretty, uh, hysterical human being to begin with for me. Like, you know, I can That's make true. myself laugh. <laughs> <laughs> myself laugh and, and uh, people surround me and, and but I one thing that I really find fascinating about this style of comedy is the ability to improvise on the go the ability to create ideas you know by being in that setting and, and I also think that there's something special about being in that space with other brains who are thinking either similarly or quite different and being able to create a lot of these. And I, I, I'm gonna have to actually go back and, and look at some of these comics because uh, ironically enough, one of my friends, he recommended, uh, what's the one you just said, Magma? Manga comics, yeah, they're Japanese. Manga, yeah. yeah, he recommended that I should read them primarily because they're so different than the comics you know, here or the comics that I read while I was in Russia. But I, I think that there is something to be said between how the literature is written according to either the lifestyle that was, you know, back in the day when it was written, or the lifestyle of just the culture in general. But I also think it's it kind of ties into all of this entire concept of inspiration in looking at the different cultures and seeing like, okay, for me being in the US, the inspiration does oftentimes come from some form of progress some sort of movement forward, some sort of doing versus here. What I've experienced is, as I shared with you earlier, when I was hiking the uh, Camino from Lisbon to Spain, I mean, there were so many things that I found inspiring and it happened in me just sitting there oftentimes or not doing anything, 
not meeting people, not conversing, but like sitting on, you know, a brick or on the grass or whatever it was. And all of a sudden I would get this like feeling or sensation and just get this huge rush of energy. So it, that would be really interesting to observe just how, um, how different the lifestyles actually impact the overall concept. Like what does it actually mean to feel inspired depending on where you're from? Well, I think you're talking about what are variously known as flow states, right? Which um, yeah. author Mahai Chiksent Mahai wrote about in the book Flow. You know, it's kind of a chronic bestseller at this point. But the idea of being in a state where you're feeling at ease, feeling connected and related to the world around you, you feel a sense of awe or inspiration about life and beauty, a sense of meaning and purpose. You know, one could argue that there's a strong neural integration going on in those moments. Our left hemisphere and our right hemisphere are connected up and making beautiful sense of the world around us. Who knows? But it's certainly a relaxed state. We're not, in, we can't be under stress, right? We can't mm -hmm. feel that our survival is at stake and also be in a state of flow. It's, they're not compatible. And I think uh, one reason why many people may find themselves stuck and not inspired, you know, is because our society and our world has a tendency to make us feel threatened a lot of the yeah. time. Uh, between the time that you and I last spoke and now, I've read two books that I think really highlight a lot of the stuff we were talking about last time. Uh, one is called A Hunter Gatherer's Guide to the 21st Century by um, Heather Hang and uh, Brett Weinstein. And then What Happened to, which is by Bruce Perry and Oprah. And That's they both, book. yeah, it's fabulous. Mm -hmm. It's worth reading on audiobook because they speak their parts. Um, but what they both kind of share is this idea of the inhospitable place that the modern world is for essentially our, our poor bedraggled hunter-gatherer selves. Uh, Heather Hang and Brett, Brett Weinstein call it hyper novelty. That not only is our word no world novel, it's new. So much is new, but it's new in a new, unexpected, unprecedented way. And it's mm -hmm. buffeting and barraging our poor, fragile systems, every sensory domain all the time. And that leads us to experience threat and danger, uh, you know, both real and imagined. A lot of the time it eats up our bandwidth, bandwidth that could be bandwidth that we would need in order to feel the sense of flow or awe or inspiration. Um, it takes us out of the present moment rather than putting us in. And, you know, we have to actively work against those hyper novel forces in this world, in this world of ours to bring ourselves into the present moment to take, have that more ambient Eastern style approach, whether it's through things like mindfulness practices, or yoga, or you know, uh, visualizations, or improv. And improv is a form of meditation. Um, mm -hmm. It's a form of being in the present moment. So I think it's it might be John Kabat-Zinn who defined uh, mindfulness in this way. I could be wrong, but it's the idea of paying attention to the present moment on purpose without judgment. And that's mm. a critical component of being improvisational. Improvisational basically means responding to what's happening now. Now, you know, mm -hmm. so you and I are improvising right now. Mm -hmm. I don't know what you're talking about next. And <laughs> right? I mean, it could be something amazing. It usually will, it usually is. <laughs> Madison in her book, Improv Wisdom says, life is an improvisation, if we're lucky, a long one, right? So for me, it's not just about, uh, you know, the improv piece is not just about being funny, although I love being funny and I love mm -hmm. making people laugh and I love laughing and humor is one of my favorite tools to use in therapy. It is a therapeutic tool, you know, get a therapist who can help you laugh because you need to be able to laugh and cry. Um, but it's also about unlocking your brain and being in the present moment and it's exhilarating. And I think the exhilaration and the joy and the flow that I, I get from working with people in an improvisational way um, is just as important and just as healing as 
other kinds of mindfulness practice. It's different. I think it's a little bit more exhilarating, a bit more like mm -hmm. you know, activating than the settling of just say sitting quietly and watching babies crawl around, which I also do. <laughs> that's its own. Yeah, it's a beautiful meditation to do. But um, I mean, if you want to do improv, we could do some right now if you want. <laughs> in service of the situation. <laughs> do, you, do you find one thing that I wanted to quickly ask you and, and then I'm more than happy to try this uh, exercise or this part of the conversation, but I, I'm curious when, when it comes to humor in general, because I actually asked one of my friends the same question last Saturday when we were having a conversation and I said, why is humor able to break down some of these walls and barriers that seriousness is not able to? Why is it like based on what you've researched and based on what you've done, why is it able to do that? How is what does it happen into that me being serious and you know, quote unquote, in control of the situation is simply not able to get through? Sure. So Sigmund Freud, the creator of modern psychotherapy, the developer of psychoanalysis, which later became known as psychodynamic theory identified that we have this really vulnerable raw part of ourselves right he called it uh, he called it the id which is the part where sort of all of our yucky instincts and whatever come up out of and then we have this other part called the superego which is sort of like the finger wagging nanny who's mm -hmm. like you do that and then there's the ego which is sort of in the middle being like what is happening <laughs> um and the poor little ego has to defend itself from the kind of uncomfortable desires of the id. And it also has to defend itself from the harshness of the superego. So Freud proposed that we have these defense mechanisms, ways that the ego protects itself, ways that the self protects itself from our baser and more kind of authoritarian mm -hmm. forces, right? And he kind of rank ordered them in terms of their level of sophistication. Some of them he deemed quite primitive and some of them he deemed quite sophisticated. He deemed humor to be a rather sophisticated defense mechanism. Mm -hmm. It's a way of dealing with some of the more unpleasant aspects of being human, of feeling human, some of our more unpleasant impulses and instincts and we can we can see them and face those things more comfortably, right? Um, the famous Yiddish folk author Shol Malachim said, "We laugh through our tears," you know. And it's you know, there's something uniquely human about smiling and laughing. It's it's primates do it a little bit, right? We are primates. Um, we we and apes and all the other primates co-descended from common ancestors. So there's this thing about like you show your teeth, like why is showing your teeth a sign of I mean you no know, harm? Because usually that means I'm gonna bite you, you know? But That's somehow, a really good question. <laughs> but somehow like this became an evolved social signal that means I mean you no know, harm. Maybe it's I'm gonna show you my teeth, but I'm not gonna use them. I don't know. Um, but there's something about this social signal of a smile and a laugh that indicates I mean you no know, harm. Laughing and smiling, they you know produce a positive effect within us. If you mm -hmm. if you smile, someone else smiles reciprocally, and it sends signals to your body that you're okay, right? We um, it's called facial feedback. Um, and I had someone tell me once, if you're going to be a good therapist, never get Botox because if you can't move your face, you can't feel what your client is feeling. You know, and mm. you pretty quickly if someone has had Botox around their eyes or if they're not really smiling because they don't get those smile lines like this yeah. kind of smile versus this kind of mm -hmm. smile, right? The dead in the eyes smile that kind of makes you think that you're with a serial killer. You know, there's an authenticity um, in the kind of smile that comes from our whole face. So I think humor and smiling, you know, there are these sophisticated ways that they allow us to face difficult things, you know, head on.
you think about some of your favorite comedians, they're talking about some really hard, painful stuff. And sometimes when they miss yeah. the mark, Ooh, you know, because yeah. they're talking about really edgy material and the line between humor and too close to home is very, very thin sometimes. Um, mm -hmm. and I think those are some of the reasons. I, I, evolutionarily, I would love to know more about where it comes from. Certainly, anybody who's ever had a baby can tell you that when the baby begins to smile and laugh, around the age of six months, you know, it's like it's three to six months when they really start getting those social smiles and laughs down. It's the best thing in the whole world, right? Like until that point, a parent feels really alone. The child is basically not reciprocal. They're still very fierce, yeah. you know? And all of a sudden we're having a relationship. Like I can make the baby laugh, the baby smiles. I make the baby smile and the baby says, oh, I, you know, I make mommy smile, you know? Um, I think it also means we're less alone with the things that we're feeling. Mm -hmm. I don't know. What do you think? Well, it, it also makes me think of uh, yawning. That's an, I know it's a, you know, a little bit of a um, rabbit hole example, but it's the same exact thing. I can't help but yawn myself when I see someone else do it. I can't help but sneeze when I see someone else do it or, or cough or some of these other things. And I've noticed the same exact thing when it comes to smiling. I mean, it's one of those things when, when I see someone smile, it's like I, I would really have to, I don't know what I would have to do to hold it back, but it's like one of those things that truly is almost impossible not to do. Yeah. You know, like when I, even if, even if I don't show it, there's something within me that I'm still feeling like this, positive burst of energy and just like yeah. happiness and joy and and i think you know the face and whatever else it just helps release it um maybe just out of the body or i don't this is the part where i don't know how it, how it actually works but it works the way it does but you know like once i release it then it's able to somehow like connect to you and and like other people and other beings and um, so that, that part is really fascinating to me, how it works and why it works the way it does. And going back to the why question, maybe that's not even important. Maybe it just yeah. works because it works. And that's, that's it. I mean, like, there's no reason to justify, you know, why does it happen the way it does? Where I guess the question is like, what, why, what is the need of knowing? Yeah. Why do we need well, to know where these things come from? There is some interesting answers to that particular why. Um, which I which I think are fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, you're talking about something that's known in various places as emotional contagion, right? Um, and mm -hmm. it's, you know, what happens when so something sad happens in a movie, they start crying, you start crying. Or like if someone gets nauseous in a movie, or you see a friend get nauseous, you get nauseous. Someone smiles, you smile. Emotional contagion. It's it's a direct neural to neural connection that uh, capitalizes on. Um, this facial feedback that I just talked about. We also have neurons in our brain that fire in us when we see other people do things. So let's say I watch you pick up a book. The neurons in my brain responsible mm -hmm. for moving my arm also fire. And the hypothesis that is reasonable for where this comes from is that we're pack animals, right? So we're primates. Um, we're not solitary mm -hmm. creatures. We evolved to live and work cooperatively in groups. One human being is no match for a saber-toothed tiger. One human being can't take down a woolly mammoth. But 10 human beings with spears, thinking and coordinating and working together, now that's a force to be reckoned with. But we need to be able to communicate clearly and quickly about what's going on. Mm -hmm. The fastest way to do that is for other people to pick up on our emotional cues. You know, this happens with children and babies that are too young to be able to say what it is that they feel. So they just put their feelings right into you, you know, and I, mm -hmm. I talk to lots of parents who are like, the baby was crying and I couldn't get them to stop. And then I just started crying and we were both crying for a while. And I'm like, yeah. Oh, yeah. They were projecting. I'm sure my parents have plenty of stories, you know, yeah. even when I uh, <laughs> give I them everything that they can handle. <laughs> That's right. And that's kind of, it's going back to Freud and the, the 
primitiveness. It's a very primitive primal way of communicating, which is we put our feelings in other people, quite literally, this form of direct emotion to emotion communication. So, you know, we smile because we are a communal species. We smile when we see someone else smile because we've depended on one another for survival. It's so weird now that we live in a world where we see thousands of people in a week, depending on where you live. Like I live in LA yeah. and I can see, a, you know, a hundred people in a day that I don't know that I'm never going to see again, who are basically strangers and threatening to me, right? Our, my brain will register a threat, even if it doesn't do so on a conscious level. Um, but that's weird. Our ancestors lived in small bands where there were maybe 80 to 100 people. And that was the total number of faces you would see for your entire life. So mm -hmm. your smile and their smile were intimately, you know, interlinked and your fear and their fear were intimately interlinked. If you see something over there, they need to know about it because whatever you see that's frightening you is about to frighten them. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But it's mm -hmm. also why seeing somebody with some kind of face feeling some kind of way, although with a mask on these days, but seeing, yeah. somebody, seeing somebody with some kind of face in the grocery store can wreck your whole day. And somebody with a beautiful smile can make your whole day. You know, yeah. it reminds us of what it is to be human on a very core level. And I, I do try to discipline myself in this. And I, I teach my associates who I'm training to be therapists. Like, sometimes you just got to fix your face. Like, you might be <laughs> like this. You know, like, put the eyebrow down, you know, and like... <laughs> Put the corners of your lips up a little bit, smile with your yeah. eyes, like Tyra said, and just be like, hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, because you also don't know, the other part that's fascinating about that is you don't know whose world you can change. And that's the thing that I've realized is even in walking across the street or wherever it is, yes, smiling at someone or saying, hello, how is your day going, things like that. Yeah, there's. I think when it comes to the phrases, especially in my opinion, sometimes they lose meaning because you know I, I don't oftentimes stop and actually ask the question and then wait for the response. It's it's just something that's kind of been I don't know an acceptable form to exchange. Hi, how are you? And but you just keep going. But I think the smile is something really interesting, at least for me, because whenever I walk by someone and someone smiles instantly something changes within me. Like I could, I could be having everything be going south and all of a sudden I see a smile and somehow all those thoughts that I was thinking before get triggered to think of something else completely different. Yeah. And so in a way, I do believe in this and, and I'm curious if you do as well, I believe everyone and everything can be an inspiration to each other. And that's the same exact point that you just made. And that's, I, I believe we are all interconnected somehow. I mean, we're not, we may not be experiencing the same set of circumstances, but at the end of the day, I think that interconnection helps in some of these situations, such as seeing someone else smile or seeing someone go through a hardship. I mean, there's a reason why I don't know a single thing about what the person's going through or who they are, but yet I'm instantly able to connect through empathy. And sit there and ask, like, okay, can I help? Or and I have no idea who this person is. Yeah. You know, and yeah. I may never meet them again after that. That's that's the also fascinating part. And so that's where I think this concept of inspiration, I mean, I, I wholeheartedly believe that I could be an inspiration to other people as well as other people and other things, other beings can be an inspiration to everyone else. Yeah. You know, I think you're speaking to something that is we're experiencing a deficit of progressively in mm -hmm. our society. And at the end of What Happened to You by, by Bruce Perry and Oprah, they talk about this longitudinal study of em measures of empathy and sociopathy, like antisocial traits in college students over time. What they've found is that in the last, I think, 20 or 30 years, measures of empathy uh, in co college graduates have drastically declined mm -hmm. and measures of sociopathy have drastically increased. And that, that's nothing to say about the college graduates themselves. 
it really points more to our values as a society and how they've shifted away from the kind of person to person interactions that you're talking about and more toward things, you know, what I can't remember who called it junk values, but oh, it's um, Johan Hari from uh, 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 Lost Connections. He says, you know, we, our society has embraced junk values, values of materialism, power, hierarchy, you know, ownership, all, all of these things, likes, you know, hi, hi here yeah. we are. So Popularity, yeah. yeah. You know, as opposed to building the kind of relational experiences that you've talked about and that you're working to build in your life uh, that would foster empathy, that would foster the sense of namaste, right? The divine in me honors the divine in you. Like you're a person, I'm a person. Here we are both on this plane of existence. You're not just some like random pawn that crossed my path. Uh, and honestly, we, you know, there's some part of that that's, I think, appropriately, you know, defending ourselves. It's threatening, like I said, to live in a world where we see so many strange and foreign people. And it's, we have to find a way to sort of block out some of the overwhelming stimuli that come in. Some of us are better at it than others, but many mm -hmm. people are plagued relentlessly by the noise pollution, the light pollution, the air pollution, the, you know, all of the sounds and smells and, and experiences of modern life that, that overwhelm us. Um, but that means we also get sort of tuned out to the human experience as well, mm -hmm. connected from the ability to form empathy. Uh, I, I wanted to have this opportunity um, when my youngest was born to do this program called Roots of Empathy. And I wasn't, I wasn't able to participate, but it's this program where they bring babies into like middle schools and high schools, like a parent and a baby, and they interact with the students and the students get to ask questions and play with the baby and get curious. And it's this way of actively fostering empathy and a sense of mm -hmm. human connection. And you know, I think there's many ways that we can do that, but I, I think certainly you could do, you could spend your whole life these days and not really know how to relate to other people. And I yep. think for me in my line of work, I see that quite a bit where I see really successful people, people who, you know, they, you know, they've done very well by themselves, arguably their LinkedIn profile looks pretty great. And they have a child and they're undone. Their two-year-old says no, you know, their three-year-old throws their spoon on the floor and screams or won't put their shoes on and they don't know what to do and they're floored. And it's not because a three-year-old or a two-year-old or one-year-old carries any particular power or anything, but I think because the, so the kind of social and emotional skills that you need to relate skillfully and wholeheartedly and with boundaries to a small mm -hmm. child are ones that you can be very successful in this world and simply not build. Things like empathy and perspective taking, setting boundaries, making clear requests, right? All of these things, oh, dealing with conflict, navigating conflict, mm -hmm. totally, you can avoid all of that somehow and get to be 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, however old, and not yeah. have to do. Yeah. You know, the one thing that truly inspires me about you and the work that you're doing is your ability to just tell it how you see it. I know for me, it's taken me a while to get to this point where I can have a conversation literally about anything, no matter how difficult the topic might be. But that's solely because I'm genuinely interested in wanting to learn more. You know, everything about COVID, I mean, that's a topic for a whole other conversation, but it's just like there's so many fascinating questions. Exactly. But one thing that is inspiring for me is your ability to do that and how you are so open about many of these topics. And I'm curious for the sake of this conversation, because obviously you and I can continue having this for another hours upon hours, but where can people find out more as far as your work, anything that you have in regard to the blog? I know that we have, this is one of the websites that we have for you. Is there oh, yeah. another place that people can connect with you and learn more about what you have going on in your world? Yeah, that's my like therapy office online. If you want to, 
find out about my work as a therapist here in Los Angeles. I have links to my blog on that page. My blog is called Living in Captivity, as I may have mentioned on a previous website, mm -hmm. on our previous podcast. And it's simply livingincaptivity.blog. You can also find me on Facebook and I, I share out, you know, stuff that I've written as well as other things that I find interested and related to all this stuff. And it's just me, Rebecca Helford, living in captivity. I think you've linked to me a few times when you mm -hmm. uh, put these things out. So yeah, our helfordmft.com or livingincaptivity.blog are great ways to find me and what I'm thinking about. Mm. I love every time that you and I connect because we go down all of these different paths and yet I think somehow always find a way to come back around regardless of how the difficult topic might be. So I just, I would just want to appreciate you for being part of this and, you know, spending some time here and sharing everything that you've learned and are yet to experience. And the same exact way, I think having had all these experiences, all I'm, all it's leading me is believing that as soon as I think I know something else and I know nothing. And yeah. you actually said the same exact thing, you know, prior to us starting this. And ironically enough, the, the password to the Wi-Fi that I'm using in the hostel that I'm at is Socrates. Socrates. <laughs> well, you are in Athens. You are in Greece. And said it best. All I know is I know nothing. Do you have a moment for a gift? Would you like it? I do. Of course. Okay. So this is this is an improv exercise. And again, it, improv isn't about being funny necessarily, although it can be. It's mm -hmm. more about finding the inspiration, right? And the, mm -hmm. or rather allowing it to come from wherever it comes from. This is actually a, a improv exercise that I adapted from uh, Patricia Madsen's book, uh, Improv Wisdom. And I did a little video about it on my blog. So if you want to, ever want to do it again, you can visit my blog. It's called A Gift from Your Mind. So for those of you who are out there in Facebook land, you can participate along with Alec and we'll, uh, you know, we'll, we're going to find a gift. Okay. So this is like a little improvisational meditation. We're going to see what's in uh, your mind today, Alec. Okay. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> who, who even knows? Okay. <laughs> So, like any good meditation, you can you can keep your eyes open, you can put them at half mast, you can close them, you can do whatever you feel comfortable doing. And just take a moment to notice where you are. Notice that you are sitting in a spot that I hope is comfortable. Notice your feet on the floor. Notice the earth beneath your the floor. <laughs> Follow your the, the chain of connection all the way up back your legs, to your seat, to your back, and just be here in this moment. And as you do that, I want you to visualize a gift in your mind. Don't prepare, just see it. See how clearly you can visualize this gift. How big is it? What shape is it? What color? Is it wrapped? Or is it a plain cardboard box? Does it have ribbons? Or a tag? If you shake it, does it make a sound? How heavy is it? What does it feel like to hold in your hands? Allow yourself to discover it. Don't prepare. Just be curious about this present, this gift in your mind. Now you're going to set this gift down in front of you very carefully. And when I tell you to, I want you to open it in the way that you would most like to open a gift, whether that's neatly and saving all the wrapping paper for an art project or tearing into it with your very hands or getting a pair of scissors. But the most important thing is do not plan what is in this gift. You don't know what's in there. You're gonna discover it. 
So when I tell you to, you're going to open your gift. You're going to reach inside and you're going to pull out the contents. Go. Open your gift. Reach inside. What is it? What have you found? Look at it all the way around. Turn it and behold every angle. What's it for? What do you do with it? Maybe nothing. Picture yourself using this gift in the way either that it was intended or that you want to. Notice the feeling on the inside as you behold this gift. What do you notice on the inside of your body? A bubbling in your stomach, a tingling in your shoulders. Take a moment to notice the effect on the inside of your body of this gift. As you hold the gift in one hand, I want you to pick up a bit of the wrapper in the other and notice that written on it is who it's from. Notice what happens as you recognize the giver of this gift and offer them your thanks for what they've given you today. And give them your assurance that you will use this gift today and forever for your good and for the good of everyone. Take one more moment with your gift and place it somewhere, somewhere in your mind so that it will be right where you need it whenever the time should come. Take a moment to be with whatever shows up as you place your gift aside for safekeeping and whatever the aftermath is of this improvisation. So what did you find, Alec? I found this thing that I used to have when I was a child at home. I don't know how to describe it. It's a ball. And on the bottom, you're able to wind it up. And, and inside of the ball, there is this, um, I want to say I was given this for Christmas. Inside of a ball, there's a little kid. And it, it's, it, it's playing one of the uh, Christmas songs. Who it was from was, it actually was not from a single person, but rather it was from home. So anyone who represents home for me, and that's my best friend, my parents, some of my other really close people in my life. And I just thought it was really fascinating because towards the end, it, it started you know, it, it started as all of these different shapes and then it became more and more clear and then towards the end it became this like, giant thing that I was able to see. It was beautiful. It was, it was so beautiful. And, and within that, I think what I've also found is a feeling of just pure joy and happiness in being able to see that gift and hold it and recognize that when you said, who is it from? And the fact that no name came up, but rather a concept, home, everyone that represents home to me, even my dog. I mean, it was just, I can't really describe it to you. I, I want to thank you. Thank you for that. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I could feel it. I could feel that it was a powerful, that something powerful was emerging for you. And who knows where it came from? Where does yeah. inspiration come from? <laughs> Simply put, yeah. yeah. 
Well, and and I think the beauty and and like thanks, thank you for sharing this beautiful, touching gift that came to you. And it's not it's not surprising. A lot of I do this this gift exercise with with folks often because it demonstrates like there's goodness inside that we can connect with and mm -hmm. there's always something that you can always find something from your mind you don't have to try you didn't know that was going to be in the box right yeah correct so there's always something and then there's always more if you think you're empty if you think you're uninspired if you think there's nothing sorry but you're wrong mm -hmm. Something in the box. Mm -hmm. At every given moment. That's right. I want. I want to thank you. I want to thank you for for doing this, for being a part of it, and for giving me this gift. I, I truly, words can't even summarize it. But I, I want to thank you for that, and, and thank you for creating that inspiration for me. That that gift is always accessible to me at any given moment. That one and so many others are like. Mm hmm.